we are now live on Zoom and we are live streaming to YouTube too, so people can go to YouTube and they can also watch and participate, ask their questions on YouTube for the Super Chat. Um, this is the April meeting. Oh, we're getting another person. It's Cindy. This is the um. This is the April meeting of the uh, Greater Fredericksburg Chapter of the American Recorder Society, and our topic this month is Historic Articulation Patterns. And we are actually joined by a couple of uh, special guests today, people that don't normally show up to our meetings. And the first person I'd like to introduce is Edward Billencone. He is my Alexander teacher, so for those of you who came to our meeting, our actual last in-person meeting on the 1st of March, we talked about basic the basic Alexander techniques. So we did a little inhibiting, we did a little directing, we did a little bit of observation, and then we played our recorders and observed what crazy things we did while we were playing with the recorder. And my teacher is here today, and he would like to take a minute to talk about um, his online classes. So he is offering some online classes in the Alexander Technique, and I'm going to screen share and let Ed talk. Can we do that? I'm up. He's up. You're up. Can hot. you all hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, just briefly. Okay, let's see. Ah. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. You're welcome. As I said to my students when I when faced with uh, teaching um, from a distance, I was certainly um, befuddled, but realized that this medium has potential. And so I've begun to compile one hour sessions that people can attend. The first one being the, the introduction to Alexander's principles as you can see, awareness, inhibition, and direction are the three main principles. And we talk about what those words mean because when I first started this work 35 years ago, I had no idea what those words really meant. So we do a deeper dive into those. Uh, next up is the, the movements of the head and the neck. And de depending on, on what body uh, training you've done, whether it's yoga or Pilates or uh, Feldenkrais or um, Rolfing and, and whatever, people have different ideas about how things uh, organize, either from the top down or from the bottom up. Um, but I would contend that the, uh, you know, the nervous system and the head area is the chief navigation system for how we manage ourselves in space. And that affects our breathing, articulation, uh, and so on. Next is um, one of my favorite little ditties because I was also a professional dancer long ago is happy feet. And as we age, sometimes our feet get um, in trouble. <laughs> and this is a wonderful study about linking the head to the feet learning to walk better, stand better, run better, or whatever. It's, it's a fun thing. Working at the computer, uh, again, a lot of us are doing a lot more of that than we ever did before. And what does that do to our bodies and how do we manage that the best way possible? And again, um, as recorder players, I, I'm sure that you all do a fair amount of sitting as well as standing. Uh, so there's that. Uh, constructive rest, another one of these topics that unless you experience it, until you've experienced it, constructive rest is not the same as plain old taking a nap. And to find out what that means and how you can use it and how profound uh, an effect it's had on many musicians over the years is, um, is, is really worth doing. Um, again, some people have issues with um, 
again, the head neck coordination and the whole body coordination. But, it's, but since we're also doing a lot of reading these days, how do we manage to take care of ourselves when we're reading, when we're working at the computer? So those are just some of the ones that I have coming up. And as you can see there, uh, Kelly has highlighted the, um, my email and the, um, so that, that way you can get in touch with me if you're interested. It's um, Bill and Shown Bear at Comcast.net. So I, I don't know how, this, how much this is gonna be available to your folks, Kelly. Okay. Actually, I'm already excited about the use of the eyes while reading, changing from reading, you know, solid print music most of the time to reading music on the screen has me extremely excited. Um, and working at the computer, I can see everybody who's had to move from um, a more traditional format to a computer format needing that work. And our members got a little bit of an introduction to the Alexander technique, but everyone, everyone would benefit from a further examination. So um, Mr. Ed can upload his little flyer here into the chat so you can all download that if you'd like. And now we're going to continue with our main event. So I, I just want to, uh, I want to say one last thing, Kelly, which is yes, thank absolutely. you for inviting me. Absolutely. And, and thank you all for listening. We're glad to have you. And we're gonna be talking a lot about things that go on in the head and neck today. We are going to be talking about historic articulations for the recorder. Um, we've got our information here. We are the Greater Fredericksburg Chapter of the American Recorder Society. We are a chapter, we're not a recorder consort. So for most of what we do every month, we meet and we usually have some sort of program and then we play a little bit afterwards. We're still working on the how do we play a little bit afterwards, but we're going to continue with our programs. I'm our chapter rep. I'm Kelly Kasich. Our tech officer is Jarrett Rodriguez. So if you've got questions as we go on, um, put them in the chat and Jarrett will alert me to questions and all that kind of stuff. We've got our email here, fredericksburgrecorders at gmail.com. We have a website that anyone can access. You can see the website there. We have a Facebook group that anyone can join. Instagram, we are at Fred Recorder, and our YouTube channel, which we've now got up and running. So we're going to talk, talk today about historic articulations, and we're taking a forest and trees approach. So if there's anything you remember from today's talk, remember this forest, that all articulation in music, no matter what instrument it happens on, is an attempt to imitate speech. And if you think about the differences between someone reciting a poem or those robocalls that you get on your phone, you have some idea about what we're trying to achieve. When somebody is reciting a poem, you hear, or just speaking in general, you hear the lilt and the ups and downs of their speech. And when you get that robocall <laughs> that threatens that if you do not buy insurance, the CIA will hunt you down. You know, we've all gotten those robocalls. It's very, very different, and we don't want to be imitating that on our recorders, of course, unless the, the composer tells us to. Historic articulations and even modern articulations are trying to create a difference between strong and weak syllables. So again, that poetry and that matching and imitating speech. And ultimately, how strong or weak you make those articulations and which ones you use will be entirely up to you. Nobody is gonna come and take away your recorder pearls if you don't use all of these articulations. So let's begin with the first tree of the day. These are the trees that many of us know. Here in the Fredericksburg chapter, we've got 80% of our membership is wind players. So woodwinds and brass wind and we all have a framework in how we articulate on our modern instruments. So for people who aren't wind and brass players, we'll start with our modern wind playing. Modern wind playing concerns itself with articulation and because of the high air pressure needed to play a modern wind instrument, we usually concern ourselves with the following vowels in order to articulate a note. And we've got this little picture over here 
of the inside of the mouth, the roof of the mouth. So this is the top view. We've got the teeth, the top teeth. We've got that alveolar ridge, the hard palate, the soft palate, and the uvula. So the articulations that we tend to use as modern wind players are the T, the two or the ta, we say two or ta, and we strike that alveolar ridge, which is the skin behind the teeth before that sharp dip. And this can create a heart attack with a sustained tone. If we want something softer, we use the D, which is also using the tip of the tongue to strike the alveolar ridge, but is a softer consonant and creates a moderate attack with a sustained tone. Now, not all wind players are going to use these next two, but flutists and brass players definitely do. This is the K syllable which we use in modern tonguing. We use it in conjunction with the T syllable. Um, the K syllable is made slightly further back in the mouth, closer to that hard palate, somewhere in there, and made with the center of the tongue. So we've got um, double tonguing is the alternating of the syllable used at the alveolar ridge with what happens further back in the oral cavity. And if you've ever used the words tiki as in tiki torch or taco as in yum, you have double tongued. So if you never thought you ever double tongued before, if you've said those words, you've actually double tongued. And I, I've seen a couple um, uh, tonguing challenges on the American Recorder Society Facebook this past week saying, oh, learn your double tonguing. Okay. And modern instrumentalists tend to use the G, the hard G syllable, goo or ga. And we tend to alternate this with the D syllable. And this is also um, a syllable that's made with more of the center of the tongue hitting the hard palate for medium attack. So if you've ever called your puppy a doggo or discussed the paintings of Degas, you have also double tongued. So now we come to our first exercise. We're gonna try some of these syllables. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna do our best not to chew, and we're gonna do our best not to vocalize. I get that a lot from my young students. I'll say, say two into your flute, and they'll go, two, two. We're gonna try not to do that. And you're going to make kind of a recorder embouchure, which is close to nothing and you're gonna place your hand in front of your mouth and try each syllable. So I'm gonna do that. So I'm saying two right now. And now I'm going to try D. And I'm gonna try some K's. And I'm gonna try a G. And what you're looking for is, does the air feel different coming out of your mouth when you use each one of these symbol, syllables? Does it come out at a different speed? Does it come out at a slightly different angle? What do you notice? And if you're not noticing anything or noticing any change, there may be some reasons for that. So we have our first troubleshooting session here. If you don't notice any difference between your T's and your D's, you may just have an accent that doesn't make a big difference between T's and D's. So you may on a regular basis speak with a fairly soft D, uh, soft T or a hard D. Two, you may not be blowing out properly as you make these articulations. A lot of times when people are trying articulations for the first time, they, they kind of stop the air. They make their articulation with the tongue, but they don't let the air out of their mouth and uh, flute playing is hard work. No matter what the flute is, if it's the recorder, if it's the transverse flute, it's hard work. You have to make sure you blow out. The third problem that I encounter is anchoring the tongue. So this one's kind of important because going on, we're going to, to need a nice flexible tongue to do some of the historic tonguings. Under normal conditions, the tongue sits at the roof of the mouth. So the teeth in the back slightly touch and the tongue sits on the roof of the mouth. In some people, for whatever reason, they have their tongue kind of sitting on the bottom of their mouth. Um, we call that mouth breathing. They probably do a lot of mouth breathing. 
and the tip of the tongue anchors to the bottom teeth. And at that point, they try to use the middle of the tongue to hit the alveolar ridge. It's not that you can't get out any articulations with an anchored tongue, but um, in general, if you can get the tongue to the roof of your mouth, you usually have better outcomes. So I won't say it's always better outcomes, but more, um, more likely to have a better outcome if you can get your tongue to sit at the roof of your mouth. And the fourth problem that I see an awful lot, if you aren't getting any differentiation between your tonguing, is that your tongue is tight. So when I ask my students how big their tongue is, they're like, ah, it's this big. And the thing is, your tongue is actually really large and really disgusting, and it hooks in down here at the hyoid bone. And we don't think about the part of the tongue that's hooking down here at the hyoid bone, and it tends to be very, very tight. So I've got a little stretch for you. This stretch goes like this. You look up toward the ceiling and you swallow. And then you look up into the left and you swallow. And then you look up into the right and you swallow. And if you have trouble swallowing, you're tight. <laughs> Your tongue is tight. It's not going to move as freely. So I do that one with my students quite often and they seem to have good results with that. So those are the articulations that we modern players tend to, um, tend to encounter quite a lot. Are there any questions so far? Everyone's doing okay? All right. Now we're going to look at a new set of trees, and these trees might be a bit unfamiliar to us. The recorder is a woodwind instrument, but unlike modern woodwinds, it doesn't have a reed, it doesn't have high back pressure, and therefore we can use some more subtle articulation patterns than we use on modern woodwinds today. Now when we look at these patterns, I just want to remind everyone that, you know, this is a 16th century man's attempt to explain and tell you what he thinks he's doing into his instrument. <laughs> he's attempting to say, well, I make these hard syllables, I make these soft syllables, and this, this is how I think I do it. So if there are some of these syllables you can't make, don't worry about it. In his treatise on the art of recorder playing, Silvestro Ganassi briefly discusses articulation, and he says, first and foremost, quote, be it known that all musical instruments in comparison to the human voice are inferior to it. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like being inferior to the voice. For this reason, we should endeavor to learn from it and to imitate it. And he says that there are three basic kinds of articulations. Uh, teki, or teka, tera, and lira. And he's got a little chart here. So this chart comes from his treatise. And I've got the, uh, I've got a, um, the bibliography down here. And the English translation is now on I am slip. So if you don't have a copy, Head on over to I Am Slip and you can get that English translation. And if we look in his, his chart here, he has, oops, there it is. He has articulations that are very, very similar to today. Tiki, Taka, Daka, Tiki Duku, Tiri. That's a little different from today. Dara, this one's interesting, Kara, using a K to begin. And then the syllables on L, he's got those over here. So you can see what he considers the basic articulations. After Ganassi talks about all of these consonants, he recommends trying all of his combinations with all of the vowels. So a, E, I, O, and U. And we have to remember that he's talking about 16th century Italian consonants and vowels, and I could not imitate them if I wanted to. So I'm going to try to figure out what, what these vowels are and consonants are doing. 
So let's look at the consonants that Ganassi described. He described the T, which I'm going to assume is not unlike our modern T that it's happening at the alveolar ridge. And the D also seems very similar to what we do today. The K is a syllable that I just said many modern woodwind players are still using, so that's not too different from today. That is the mid-tongue hitting the hard palate. The R is usually not familiar to the modern player. And the R can be a very difficult sound for some people. In general, we're aiming for a very soft R, as in the word ru, almost like you're you're speaking, well, so you're speaking French, a ru is French, and almost like you're about to roll your R just a little bit, but not quite, ru, instead of a hard R, like pirates or rock and roll or R of SG maybes. So we're looking for something really soft that can still let the air out of our mouth. The L is also un somewhat unfamiliar to modern players. And the L is actually a very difficult sound in the English language. Um, it's one of, with the R, it is, what is it called? A lateral palliative something or other. Um, in phonetics, it has a very specific name. And what happens is that the tongue comes up to the roof of the mouth and spreads out. So when it does this, the air that's coming out of your mouth shoots out the sides instead of out the center of the mouth. So I'm assuming that 16th century Italian didn't do that. And so I'm also assuming that we're looking for a very, very soft L, like in the famous yoga pants, Lululemon, rather than the word pickle. So if you do an L, pickle, and blow out, you might find that more air is coming out the side of your mouth than coming out the center of your mouth. And that might require a substitution. So if you're having a hard time getting air out the center of your mouth with an L, you might um, need a substitution and we'll address that in a little bit. So what's with all of Ganassi's different vowels? He wanted you to not only take these consonants, but he wanted you to um, do different vowels as well. And here I've got these lovely pictures. Let me make sure that you can see that I've cited my source. I take it from uh, Jane Ruby's, Jane Ruby Hyrick's Alexander Technique for the Voice and the Alexander Technique. They are fantastic pictures. And um, at the end, when we've turned off the recording, I will give you all a bi bibliography with links so you can order these books if you're interested. But this is showing what the tongue is doing in the oral cavity as you are saying these vowels with these consonants. So as you can see, there's a whole group of, of vowels over here that are really high. They cause the tongue to come up very, very high. He, hit, hey, head, hat, and yeah. Has the front of the tongue up very, very high. And so they're going to give your sound a, a brighter sound theoretically. And then we've got a series of vowels that bring the front of the tongue down and then play with the back of, of the tongue in the oral cavity. The lowest vowel is the ah sound as in father. So that's, that's what your tongue is doing when you're saying these vowels. And then we've got the schwa. <laughs> the schwa is pretty neutral apparently. Here's our schwa. All right, so now we have an exercise. Like the first exercise, we're going to make a recorder embouchure, and we're going to bring our hand in front of our mouth. We're going to select a consonant and a vowel, and we're going to try that consonant with that vowel, and then we're going to change the vowel, and we're going to see what happens to our air. We're going to see what happens um, to the angle of the air. So I'm going to take... Uh, T's and I'm going to play with the vowels that I can do on T. And you can feel that that air is going to come out at a slightly different speed, maybe even a different angle. If I try the R's, 
I can feel a slight difference. So when you try these, do you feel a difference in the air leaving your mouth? Um, do you feel tight in the throat because you're activating the tongue differently when you try these different vowels? And we'll eventually try these on articulation and when, I'm sorry, on the recorder. And when you actually do that, do you hear a difference in the sound? But before we do that, before I show you my articulations on the recorder, um, here's a little troubleshooting. Have you ever had a lesson where your teacher said one of the following things? Relax your throat. That one makes me ragey, by the way. Or your sound is riding high or your sound is too bright or too sharp. If so, there is a possibility that you are using a vowel and therefore tongue position that's riding really high in that oral cavity. And it's causing your air to come out either too fast or too high, um, at too high an angle. It's kind of like I talk about um, with my students, the garden hose. You've got a, a, a garden hose and the water's kind of flopping out and then you put your thumb in front of it and then the water shoots out of the garden hose. Well, you bring your tongue up like that and that air is gonna come shooting out theoretically. So, interestingly enough, if you've got a tight tongue and a high vowel position, whew, well then, then uh, oh, I don't know, you basically have a Wisconsin accent. <laughs> don't you know, dear, hey, get that tongue real tight and get that vowel position up real high and you've got yourself a world of hurt when you're playing the flute. Okay, we aren't going to do that anymore. So I'm going to pick up a recorder for a moment. And, you know, if, if, it's, if it's sounding really weird over the internet, Jared can, like, give me the stop playing. But I'm going to try a couple of Ganassi's articulations to see if you can hear a difference. I'm going to try the T's, the D's, the R's, and the L's. I did ta ra ta ra and then I said da la da la and some of them were stronger and some of them were weaker as I was sitting in this room. I don't know if you heard any differences where you were sitting but since we're all muted if you want to pick up your recorders and you want to try some of these yourself I suggest giving them a try. So you'll also notice that Ganassi paired his articulations Tiki, taka, daka, tara, dara, kara. Um, so you might try that too. So give it a try. Um. And you might try your vowels too. I can get into a world of trouble with teary leery. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Did you notice any differences? Everybody good? Any questions? All right, then we'll continue. So how long did this this um, this concept of changing your articulations to imitate speech go on? Well, we know it went on at least through the mid-18th century. So now we're going to talk about some of Quance's trees in a different part of our forest. And Quance was the flute professor, or I'm sorry, <laughs> flute professor, the flute teacher of Frederick the Great of Prussia. And here we're going to cite our book, The Solfeggi. And like I said, I'll send you links, or we'll put links in the description of the YouTube. And you can see this from this notebook that Frederick the Great kept of his lessons with Quantz. Quantz would tell him to do these articulation patterns. And so you can see that Quantz seemed to have favored T, R, D, D, and now this is 18th century German, so 
I have no idea how it was actually pronounced. I don't speak 18th century German or even modern German for that matter. And he used something called dull. I have no idea what dull was really supposed to sound like. So that brings us to our substitution. So some of you might be having trouble with the L's. In the mid 18th century, diddle, whatever diddle was, was considered the acceptable double tonguing of the day. I think the performers were looking for something that gave them a little bit of the inigal, um, the little bit of the swing to their 16th notes instead of the real straight, um, I don't know, turbo, turbo kind of, of movement to their 16th notes. Because you'll notice that Ganassi back in the 16th century had no problem with tiki or taka, which is very similar to today's double tonguing. Now, because I have a really hard time with L's, <laughs> I have a really hard time getting L's to not shoot out the sides of my mouth. I was taught that a substitute for diddle is ninga. The N is a weaker consonant than the T, but the soft G in the I-N-G, I was told was a, an acceptable replacement for the L. It kind of gets us that, that lilt or that inigal. And so um, Sarah, my colleague from Washington's Camarada pointed out that the ing is kind of a proto G, which we use today for our, our uh, double tonguing. And I thought, well, yeah, it is kind of a proto hard G, a soft G. So ninga, 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 ninga. And you try to blow out with that. It's very gentle compared to taka. And I'll just do a little bit of it. So it's pretty fast and it's much more gentle. So now we're going to put our trees back in the forest unless somebody has any questions so far. We're doing okay? All right, so how do we apply this to our music? Well, first we need to know something about the pieces that we're playing. What century do they come from? Because if they're coming from the 18th century, we probably aren't going to want to use so many Ks. But if they're coming from the 16th century, go ahead and use those Ks. And I've compiled a, a table of musical gestures and possible articulation combinations to achieve a desired effect. And this is not an exhaustive list. You can come up with your own combinations. So here we go. If you were to see or want to create this shape of tongue one slur three in historic tonguings, instead of using slurs, why not give the following articulations a try? So instead of playing ta-ta, you could play ta ta ra ta to create a similar effect and a similar sort of shape. So I got my little recorder here. That's with the slur. And that's with my tongue. I don't know how much of this is coming across on the, on the computer, but uh, I hope some of it is. If you were to see the following shape in your modern music, or want to create this shape of slur three tongue one, you could try the following articulation patterns. Strong, less strong, weak, strong. Or, you can get something very similar. This next one is my favorite. If you want to create this shape of slur two, slur two, without actually slur two, slur twoing, you could use ta-ra, ta-ra. Ah, that one's my favorite. <laughs> Going on with musical gestures. If you wanted to create the shape of tongue one, slur two, tongue one, also a personal favorite, you could try the following articulations. Two strong ones, a weak one, and a strong one. I like that one. If you wanted to create a more gentle shape like you would get from a slur four, you could Try using a um, moderate articulation followed by a weak articulation. Very nice. 
And then I just went ahead and continued with some of the articulation, slur to, tongue to, tongue to, slur to, and then all tongue. Um, so you could look for places where if you wanted to create that kind of shape, that kind of sound, you could put those articulations together. And what you'll find as you put these articulations together, the strong and the weak, is that if you're following the strong and the weak of the music you're actually playing, chances are you won't go wrong. Um, if you try to fight the strong and the weak that's happening in the music, then you might have problems. So um, we have for our, is, are people still trying these? Do you want me to, to move on? Are we good? Okay. I don't know where Jarrett went. <laughs> we have uh, an example piece to try today, and I've gone ahead and I've written in some articulations. And, uh, you know, are they the only ones that could be chosen? No, they're not the only ones that could be chosen. You could substitute, you could decide, oh, I don't want all these strong tongues. I'd like some more weaker tongues. I'd like to use more L's. You know, I have a problem with L's. So we're just going to be dealing there. And this is the little duet. I tried to uh, record it in um, acapella with myself this week. And there were some sinking issues, but we tried. So if we're looking at that first soprano line, we have that shape that's, we've got, where's my highlighter? We've got a shape where we could do strong and weak and we can alternate. Ta ra ta ra ta da ta ta ra ta da ta da. That's a possibility. We could give that a try. And you see those shapes happening throughout the piece. So it, it also when you're trying to put these, these tonguings together and you're trying to do them over pieces, you'll find that pieces have very repetitive rhythmic structures. They have repetitive sorts of melodic figures. And you don't need to come up with crazy combinations all the time. You can just keep repeating the patterns that worked for the previous phrase. So I am going to, I think I have to make this smaller. No, I don't know if I can make it smaller. I did email this out to people just to uh, cite my sources. Let me go back and cite my sources here. Um, this little piece is coming from the Renaissance Recorder Anthology. Um, 30, oh, I'm sorry, no, it's coming from uh, Renaissance time, Pieces and Dances, and then we'll look at a piece that's coming from the anthology. So, again, that'll be in our description. So, anybody who wants to play along with me, here we go. One, two, three, four. We'll give that a try. We're just going to skip the repeats for now. So here we go. One, two, three, four. sorry we 
we can't play it together. But uh, how'd everyone do? Is everyone doing well? I don't know what's going on with the chat there. Um, let's see. There's nothing happening in the chat right now. Nobody's chatting. All right. No. But I can I can speak for myself and say I played along with you and we had a beautiful duet happening. Nice, even when I messed up my screen. Excellent. All right. The second piece that I chose for us to try, I only wrote in some of the articulations that I would do. This is a galliard, um, and it's from the it's from the Renaissance Recorder Anthology, Book Two. This is a fantastic book series because they have um, they have play along CDs and MP3s. So as we're all quarantined and we can't play with other human beings, you can at least play along with the MP3s. So these are really nice. And as I was talking, these especially 16th century dances have a lot of um, a lot of phrases and rhythmic structures that are the same. So you can decide what combination of strong and weak tongues you would like and just kind of go to town and you don't have to come up with crazy combinations for every single phrase. Although if you feel like it, no one's going to take away your recorder pearls. So we're going to give this one a try if you want to try to play along with me. Oh, and this one fits all on the screen. So. And this one should fit on both alto and soprano. And let's see, I'm going to count off. All right, I'll count off quarter notes. Shall we make that easiest? I'll, count, I'll give you four quarter notes. One, two, three, four. So did all of you keep going with these articulations? Did you give them a try? Did you do okay? Yeah, I, I gave them a try. Um, and because it's kind of the same thing. I just continued with the the ta ra ta ra ta ra da. Yeah, you can. Long is very hard for me. I mean, it's going to take time, of course, to get used to putting all that together, but it's not impossible. Um, so we're going to start from the beginning one more time, and this time we'll go all the way through, and I promise I won't stop. I just want to make sure no one had any questions. So here we are from the beginning. I'll give you four beats. One, two, three, four. stop screen sharing at this point. I had trouble, very tight. Oh, Jared had a tight tongue at one point. Yep. Interesting little thing, huh? Doing the, the stretches and the swallowing, like that was very restrictive. Yeah, interesting. All right, so I think that we should probably um, end our recording, take our questions, exchange any more information that needs to be exchanged if 
anybody wants to talk with Ed for a second, then we can do that. Um, we will be having another meeting the first Sunday in May. Now this was supposed to be our end of the program year party, so whatever we decide for our topic, we will be doing it with a glass of wine. So, <laughs> yeah, Bill will, Bill will have his Prosecco with him, and, uh, you know, we'll have our glass of wine, and then we'll figure out what our topic for May will be. And so, um, before we end our recording, anything else? All right. Thank you for coming today to our recorder meeting. See you next month. All right, we're unmuted. Anybody? That was a lot to, to digest. It's a lot. I'm going to put the um, the handout and the bibliography and all that stuff in the in the chat right now. So I'm gonna take care of all that administrative stuff.